In this video, we're gonna cover PS2 emulation setup in the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. Welcome to my updated PS2 RetroArch setup guide. It's been a while since we last talked about PS2 emulation within RetroArch, and while not really much has changed other than the name and downloading the core, the standalone version of XBS X 2.0 has really taken off and is definitely the preferable way to go when it comes to PS2 emulation. So as a result, I do heavily recommend people just check out my XBS X 2.0 tutorial instead of using RetroArch. If you're still interested in using RetroArch, we will go over the basic setup steps, but advanced features I'm not really going to go over just because they are, again, handled better within XBS X 2.0 standalone. But let's go ahead and dive in. So as we get started, this guide is once again a continuation of my RetroArch and dev mode setup guide, so if you don't have dev mode setup or RetroArch installed, a link to this video will be in the description below and it will get you all set up and taken care of to then begin following along with this guide. And if you're interested in emulating systems besides the PS2 or checking out that standalone XBSX 2.0 tutorial I mentioned earlier, there are a ton of guides in my emulation on Xbox Series X and S playlist. So again, if you are into PS2 stuff, I do heavily recommend checking out XBSX 2.0 instead of using RetroArch and all the additional guides that I have to go with it. But link to this playlist will also be in the description below. Now the first step to getting our PS2 emulation up and running within RetroArch is to acquire a PS2 BIOS file. Yes, you do need BIOS files for PS2 emulation, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work. And unfortunately, RetroArch is kind of particular about the ones it likes. Despite most PS2 BIOS files being perfectly fine within XBSX 2.0 or PC emulation, RetroArch has seemed very particular and I honestly have no idea why, but results may vary on the BIOS files you have. But if you do happen to have an original fat PS2 or slim PS2, I do still have guides on how to dump BIOS files from those so you could get those with relative ease. If you have a PC with RPCS3, you could also dump a PS2 BIOS from the PS3 firmware using this video. I'm honestly not sure if this BIOS file works on LRPS2, but we're gonna find out in this video. Otherwise, you can resort to the Googles and find a BIOS file that way, but as always, illegal download links are not provided on this channel, so please do not ask. But once you have your BIOS file sourced, it could be split into a multiple file one like this, which is what I'm going to be using today for this video, or it could be a single bin file. It shouldn't matter, but again, LRPS2 can be kind of picky about BIOS files, so even if you have a good one, it might not work. And then if you dump one from the PS3 emulator for PS2 games, it needs to be named PS3 underscore PS2 underscore MU underscore BIOS dot bin. But go ahead and get the USB drive you're using for your Xbox emulation projects plugged into your computer and open it up. Now from here, navigate to your RetroArch system folder. Once inside the folder, create a new folder and name it PCSX2. Open that folder up and inside create a new folder named BIOS and make sure everything is in lowercase. And once you have that folder made, go ahead and drag your BIOS files right on in. So I have two BIOS files in here again. I have the one from my FAT and then the one from the PS3 emulator. With your BIOS file in place, all you need now is PS2 games. If you have a large physical collection of PS2 games, I have a couple of guides on the channel outlining how to dump those using various methods, so links to these will again be in the description below for anyone interested, or as always you can resort to the Googles, but again, no illegal download links are provided on this channel. As for the supported formats your PS2 games can be in, ISO, CISO, CSO, CHUD, BIN, gzip are going to probably be the main ones you come across or convert yours to. And then of course .m3u files are used for multi-disc games and set up for that we will go over in just one second. So in my PS2 games folder I have a number of chud compressed files as well as ISO files. Again they both work just fine. And then I have one CD based game Half-Life in bin format right here. And then I have my multi-disc games separated into subfolders. So for example Metal Gear Solid 3. So for easier use within RetroArch, you're going to want to create M3U files for these games. So the process of doing this is to right click, new, text document, name it whatever you want, open up the text document, and now we're going to paste the file name of our games plus their extensions into the text document. 
So if you can't see the file extensions on Windows, you can easily show these by clicking on View, Show, and then making sure file name extensions is checked. But again, just go ahead and grab the complete file name plus extension for each disk of the game and paste it into a single line in the text document. And once all those disks are populated, go ahead and save the text document and close out of it. Now we just need to rename the extension from .txt to .m3u. So we're just gonna come over here, delete txt, m3u. It's gonna get mad at us. Go ahead and click on yes. And there we go, that multi-disc game is now set and ready to go. And now just repeat the process for any other multi-disc games you might have. But once you have your games all set and ready to go, just go ahead and get them copied over to your Xbox USB drive. So just gonna open this up, go into my games folder, and drag it right on in. And once the copying finishes, just go ahead and move your Xbox USB drive over to your Xbox and get booted up into RetroArch. Once loaded up into RetroArch, we need to download our LRPS2 core, so head over to the online updater, core downloader, and then just press right on your D-pad to scroll down to Sony, and find Sony PlayStation 2 LRPS2 and press A. With the core downloaded, we're gonna go ahead and make a games playlist to make our lives simpler. So next, head to import content and do a manual scan. And now for content directory, navigate to your E drive, games folder, find your PS2 games wherever you placed them and tell it to scan this directory. Now for system name, go ahead and press right on your D-pad to go down to Sony and find PlayStation 2. And for default core, go ahead and choose Sony PlayStation 2 LRPS2. Now, if you are like me and have your multi-disc games separated into subfolders, go ahead and turn scan recursively off for the first scan. And once set, go ahead and scroll down to start scan. Now go ahead and turn scan recursively back on and under file extensions, type in M3U. So that way all of your multi-disc games only show up as the M3U file for your playlist. Once set, start the scan again. And once everything is complete, you should now have a PlayStation 2 playlist here on the left with all of your games contained within. And then for those multi-disc games, as you can see, they are now just listed as one entry in your playlist. Now to play a game, all you need to do is select it and tell it to run. And here we are playing PS2 games within LRPS2 on Xbox Series S. So overall, it is a pretty decent experience, but again, with standalone XBSX2 available, it just probably isn't the most preferable way of doing it. But now let's go ahead and cover the core options available to us within LRPS2. So going into our RetroArch Quick Menu, Core Options. So our first set of options are in the Systems tab here, and our first selection is BIOS. So it defaulted to my console BIOS from my fat PS2, but let's go ahead and see if it works with that PS2 emulated BIOS that we dumped from PS3 firmware. So just gonna set that real quick. And now we're gonna rerun the game and see if it actually boots up. And hey, what do you know? Doesn't look like it does. All right, went ahead and reset RetroArch just to give that one more try, just to make sure something didn't get clogged up in the system setting or something, but we're gonna go ahead and give it a go. And hey, look at that. It actually does work with that PS3, PS2 BIOS. So very cool stuff. Anyway, back into our core options. So yes, you can use the PS3's PS2 emulation BIOS in RetroArch, very cool. Again, wasn't sure, but now we know it does work. Very cool. But anyway, moving on. Next option is language. So you can set your system language options here if desired. And now our next option is for fast loading. This is to speed up disk load times. You can turn this one on, but it is not compatible with every game. So if you get issues with games, just come in and turn it back off. Our next option is fast boot. You are going to want to leave this on if you are using that PS2 BIOS from the PS3 firmware, or if you want to have a region free experience with PS2 emulation. If you turn this option off, you do get the PS2 boot animation, but your games will be region locked so you would need a BIOS for every region. And the last option within this menu is to boot into the BIOS menu. So this is only available for BIOS files from original consoles. This will not work on the PS3's PS2 BIOS. 
and this will let you manage memory cards and things like that, so even though it's really nice and convenient to get the PS3's PS2 BIOS, getting one from a real console is definitely preferable just for overall user experience. Backing out our next tab, memory cards. So slot one, you could choose which memory card type is in your slot one. So a shared memory card for eight megabytes is set by default, or you could change this over to a 32 megabyte card if desired. There are a few exceptions for games that aren't compatible with cards other than the eight megabyte ones. So it is preferable to use eight megabytes here just to be on the safe side. And then under slot two, you could change this over to a 32 megabyte card. And then if you're using the console BIOS, you can transfer saves between the two as needed. Backing out, video tab. Renderer, leave this one on auto. And our next option is for internal resolution. So you can crank this up to higher resolutions for your PS2 games to look prettier. So for example, Tony Hawk 3 now running at 1440p internal resolution, looking pretty slick. 1440p is really my go-to when it comes to PS2 games on the Series S, but you can crank it up higher and see how it goes. If you start getting lag where you didn't before, just pull it back down. But as you can see, 4K, really not a problem for Tony Hawk 3. So personal preference on what you want to have this set as. Next up, deinterlacing mode. Just go ahead and leave this one on automatic. If desired, you could try some no interlacing patches that are built into the LRPS2 core but very few games are supported and it kind of just falls back to none and automatic to begin with. Next up, aspect ratio. This is set to four by three by default, but you can change it over to 16 by nine if you plan on using widescreen patches. So LRPS2 has a number of the PCSX2 widescreen patches built into the core itself. So you can enable this option to get those. And a content restart is required for these to take effect. So just go ahead and back out, close your content, and then rerun it. And when you restart your game, if it found any widescreen patches, you will now be playing in a nice widescreen presentation. So again, Tony Hawk 3 did have one, so here we are. So our next option is to enable built-in 60 FPS patches. So a number of PS2 games ran at 30 FPS. And if there's a patch built into LRPS2, you can enable this to push those games up to 60 FPS. Can cause issues, so give it a shot, see what you think. Next up, full screen anti-aliasing. If you want to reduce jaggies, you can turn this option on. Anisotropic filtering, crank this up to 16x if desired. Dithering, you can scale it or have it unscaled, up to you, personal preference, or you can turn it off entirely. I like to have it scaled personally. Next up, texture filtering. This is set to bilinear PS2 default. Leave it here for the most accurate PS2 experience, but you can mess around with the other options if you want to see what they look like. Blend unit accuracy for best performance, just leave this on basic, but if you want to get a bit more accuracy out of it, you can change it up to high. Unfortunately, full and ultra are not supported on direct 3D. Mint mapping, leave this on automatic. Conservative buffer allocation, leave this on. Accurate date, leave this on. And then for GPU palette conversion, you could go ahead and leave this one off on Xbox Series X and S. But if you have a game that can't run full speed, you could try enabling this one to see if it helps out. And then we're gonna go ahead and skip over frame skip because bleh. Anyway, backing out, gamepad. First option, enable rumble. If you don't wanna have rumble support, you can turn it off. You can also adjust rumble intensity and then set your stick dead zones for right and left analog stick. Backing out, emulation. In your RetroArch system folder inside the PCSX2 folder, you can make a folder called cheats and drop all PCSX2 PNAC files in there if you wanna enable cheats. I'm not gonna cover it more than that in this video. Again, if you wanna use cheats and other things like that, XPSX 2.0 is definitely the way to go. Next up, speed hack preset. This is set to safe. In games that are very, very demanding, you could try changing this up to balanced or aggressive. Very aggressive and mostly harmful should be avoided. As for the rest of our options, you will not need to mess with them unless specified in the PCSX2 wiki for your specific title. But more on that in a second. And our last tab, hacks. So these are specific game hacks that will be neat that will need to be set on a per game basis to get video to show up correctly for certain titles or other different things. And again, these will be determined by the PCSX2 wiki if you need to mess with them. To see if you need to have a game specific setting, just head to the PCSX2 wiki, link will be in the description below, and then just click on the game in question and it'll let you know inside the listing if it has any specific settings that need to be set. But with that, we have covered all the core options available within LRPS2. So if there's options you want to have set so if there's options you want to have set for some games but not others, as always head up to manage core options and save them as a game options file so that way whenever you load up that one specific game, 
the options will take effect for it and not others. All right, now just a quick rundown on if you need to change discs in multi-disc games. Going into your RetroArt quick menu, back out to your settings tab of the main RetroArt menu here and go to user interface. Now under paused content when menu is active, go ahead and make sure this is turned off. It'll be on by default, but make sure it's turned off for your multi-disc games so that way the emulator continues to run in the background while you change discs. But then back in your quick menu, you can go to disk control, eject the current disk. If you press A on the current disk index, you'll see all the disks listed in your M3U file. Then you can select a disk and then insert the disk. Now for games like Metal Gear, you would need to do a reset to activate the disk change. But unfortunately, the reset option is a bit broken at the moment. So unfortunately at the current moment, it's better to leave games like Metal Gear Solid 3 with its two discs as separate entries versus the typical multi-disc games that you might come across where it's fine because the disc swap will trigger because you don't have to hit reset. Now the last option I'm going to cover in this video is the use of shaders. So go into the shaders tab, make sure they're enabled and downloaded within RetroArch's online updater, and then you can begin loading up presets. So my favorites are to use the CRT ones. And CRT Easy Mode is just a really easy one to go to for a good look on both native resolution and upscaled content. But once you've found a shader that you like, and again, there's a lot of them and it is personal preference, but come back into the shaders tab, click on save, and then you can apply everything as a core preset or a per game preset, depending on what you prefer. And with that, we've covered the basics of LRPS2 setup within the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. As always, thank you so much for watching today's tutorial, and I hope it helps you get your PS2 emulation projects within RetroArch up and running to your desires. But as one final reminder, if you want the best PS2 experience on Xbox, using XBSX 2.0 is definitely preferred. But here at the end of the video, I do have the couple of usual favors to ask. Hit that like-dislike button, depending on how much you like this guy as well as that sub button notification bell so you can see when all of my new videos go live because there are tons coming and I would love for you to watch them. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel and keep it going, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little really goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing all of this content directly to you. Big shout out to all of our current backers. Thank you so much as always for believing what we do here and helping us keep it going for so long. You are the truest of champs. Thank you so much. But until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.